hit full screen on this. All right, we have three weeks left, if you can believe it or not. Uh, or that, that's just, that's crazy. It, 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 time is very interesting these days because, you know, this semester simultaneously feels like it flew by and it's it's been slow. And, and if there's any one description I would give of, of life in the pandemic, it would be that, just that, that time's a little weird. Um, Maybe, maybe it's especially so for me. I haven't had any in-person classes this year, so it's been, it's been an interesting haul. But we are, we are coming towards the end um, of our, our journey in steel design with our last topic in beams. So um, just a quick uh, set of logistical items. The attendance grades are up to date. I did that this morning, so everybody's uh, attendance grades are good. As for grading, um, uh, my TA is a little behind on homeworks 5.3 and 5.4. Uh, but I went ahead and posted the solutions. So all the column assignment solutions are posted. That's all done. Homework 6.1 is due today. Hopefully you all saw that I meant what I said, that that is a short assignment. I did this solution of that assignment on paper, and I mean, it was just a single eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and I think the calculations were that big. You know, it's a really short problem. Um, today, uh, the homework is um, maybe a little longer, um, and not really because of the steel design, but because of the structural analysis, because we're talking about beams. And so that means we need to start talking about shear and moment diagrams. Um, so we got to bring that into the, the fold. But before we get into structural analysis, we kind of need to delineate the types of beams that we're dealing with. And specifically in steel design, we're going to be talking about two different classes of beams. And those are beams that are continuously braced and those are beams that are discreetly braced. So we kind of need to talk about what bracing is. What is the effect of bracing? Uh, what does it mean? How do we denote it? Uh, there's going to be this term called LB, and we need to know what LB means. Um, so we need to also talk about how we're going to assess moment, shear, and deflection. Those are the three uh, uh, big uh, limits for, for beams. I mean, we might check stresses and whatnot, but stresses come from moments, you know. Uh, we might check, you know, strains or whatnot, but they come from deflections and all that. It really moment shears and deflections. When we look at design of buildings or bridges or really any structural element, those are the big three. And we're also going to talk about some analysis aids in the manual, which, by the way, let me go ahead and grab my manual over here uh, because we are going to uh, 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 use this uh, a fair amount today. And we're going to introduce one of the most valuable design aids that we're going to be using throughout the rest of the semester, and that's the ZX tables. Um, but let's take it one step at a time. Let's start off by recalling MP uh, and ZX. So MP, as we said, I think MP is a pretty straightforward calculation. So once you find the part where the area on top equals the area on the bottom, because specifically what we care about is the, air, is the point where the force on top equals the force on the bottom, but because the plates all have the same yield stress, we can factor that out and just worry about areas. Um, all we do is we sum the moments about that neutral axis, which we're calling it the plastic neutral axis because it's, you know, where the compression equals tension, not where the centroid is. Um, and so that's MP. Now, the way that we express that from a notation standpoint, since everything uh, is reaching the same yield stress, the same stress, FY, we can factor out FY. And now we have a section property. We just have areas times moment arms, and we call that the plastic section modulus, or this term Z. Um, we're talking about you know I beams and bending in buildings, and so most I beams are going to be bent this way, you know, about their strong axis. So we care mostly about ZX and not ZY. Uh, so that's why from here on out, you're going to really hear me focus mostly on just the strong axis because that's how beams are oriented. When we have a beam in a building, it sits like that. It usually doesn't sit like that. Okay, um, let's talk about beams. Let's talk about uh, uh, bracing and let's talk about what we're going to be assessing in this class uh, for beams. Now, in order to do that, the first thing we need to talk about is just some discussion on beam capacity. Uh, and the role of this term called LB. You haven't heard LB up until today. Today's our first uh, uh, introduction to that. So I'm going to turn on my webcam for a second here just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is a, a, a beam, okay? And when I take this beam and I bend it, okay? I take this beam and I bend it, 
you can. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, maybe I'll do it like that, um, or maybe like this. Here we go. I want to kind of focus it this way. So when I take the beam and I bend it, what happens is there's a point when it kind of sort of kicks out and twists, like it kind of does that. Kind of hard to see. Maybe I'll kind of do it like this, uh, like that. You can kind of see it sort of kicks out and twists, like the, the side sort of falls over and rotates it uh, like that. Um, there is a name for that phenomenon. We call it lateral torsional buckling. We're going to talk about LTB later. Um, but uh, that is the way in which beams buckle. And beams buckle because if I take a beam and I bend it, the top of the beam is experiencing compression. The bottom of it is experiencing tension. But because part of it's in compression, part of the beam wants to buckle, but part of it doesn't because the parts that, that, that's in compression wants to lose stability and the part that's in tension wants to keep it. And so the way that the beam resolves that is it sort of kicks out and twists and we call that lateral torsional buckling. Now a beam's capacity is a function of its bracing uh, uh, length. Just like with a column, if I have a, a column and uh, if I look at, let's say, you know, column A and column B. So let's say here's a column, right? You know, and I can compute the capacity of this column. Well, what happens if I take that column and I add a brace right here? Well, that's going to make the column stronger because what I'm doing is I'm shortening that L over R, right? If I shorten that L over R, if I make L over R smaller, that makes the capacity go up. The more braces that I put on that column, the stronger the beam or the stronger the column is, right? That's how columns work and beams work very similarly. So I want to make sure that I'm clear on, on a couple of things because um, as we start going into discreetly braced beams, you know, these, these definitions are going to expand a bit, but the core tenets are, are not going to change. So for steel beams, the maximum capacity is MP, okay? That is the absolute maximum flexural capacity that a beam can withstand. Now that's not the capacity of every beam in every building. Like if I looked at this beam, this beam's capacity might not be MP, but maybe this one over here, maybe this one's capacity is MP. So to be clear, that's not the capacity of every beam, that's just the beam's maximum possible capacity. So, uh, and, and maybe I should, should in indicate that, that that's its maximum possible capacity. What makes things complicated and what, what uh, 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 you know, adds the, 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 the riddle that we've got to figure out is buckling. So part of the beam's in compression, part of the beam's in tension, and so the beam wants to buckle. And the way that we arrest that buckling is through bracing, right? And the way that we denote that in, in beams is we look at the distance between braces, okay? And so the distance between braces is this term LB, or what we call the unbraced length. To give you kind of an idea of what I'm talking about, I've got some images here. So let's look at, uh, at the definition and then let's look at some images. So as stated, LB is the unbraced length, okay? And the unbraced length is the distance between the braces. And so when I say brace, I mean that any component of the structure that prevents that buckling action. So if you look here at my camera, here's the beam. The beam sort of buckling, you know, left to right. That side sort of goes like that, you know, like that when it buckles. So anything that prevents that that left and right motion, that lateral motion as the beam wants to buckle, that's a brace. And specifically, we're talking about the flange that's in compression because that's what's going to, to, um, to generate that buckling behavior. Now, what constitutes a brace? Okay. Well, there's a couple of examples of that. The first is if we're looking at a bridge, the cross frames or the diaphragm. So for example, if I'm looking at you know, this right here, if I'm looking at this image of a, uh, of a girder system, this is a four girder system, and you, you can see it's being fit up with a series of cross frames. So what I might say is if I'm looking at this beam, I might be looking at, let's say, this segment as an example, and that distance right there might be LB. That might be the distance between those bracing elements. For another example, if I'm looking at um, a beam in a building, one of the examples here, let me um, so let me make, use a brighter ink because that might be a little easier to see. So for example, if I'm looking at this beam, let's say I'm looking at this beam right here, you know, as you can see, let's say the beam is, I don't know, let's come up with a number like 24 feet long. Like let's say that's how long the beam is. But if you look here, you can kind of see that they have beams 
framing into it. Like there's a beam framing in right here. And so this distance might be LB and that might be only 12 feet, okay? And so what's going to dictate the capacity, how strong the beam is, is not the beam's length, but the beam's unbraced length, okay? Now the way that we're going to denote that in this class is like this, okay? So for example, let's say I have a beam that's, I don't know, 60 foot long, and there are bracings at uh, or braces at every like third point. So there's bracing at every 20 foot along the span. So the, the, the big thing I, I really want you to, to take in and so that I want you to absorb is that there is a difference between how long the beam is and how much distance there is between the brace. Both between the braces. Both values are important, okay? We need this value right here in order to do the structural analysis. Like if I go back to CE 312 and I say, okay, I want to compute support reactions, and then I want to draw a shear diagram and draw a moment diagram, I need this value right here in order to do that. So that's important. But then on the other side, okay, that's going to be the loads. That's going to be the moment diagram, the shear diagram. That's going to be where I compute the loads. On the resistance side of things, how strong the beam is, I need this value in order to determine the beam's capacity. What is its Themn and, and uh, et cetera. Um, what happens, what do braces do? Braces serve to quote unquote strengthen the beam. In other words, as that LB value goes down, the capacity is going to increase. Just like with columns, if that KL over R goes down, the capacity goes up. Now somewhat analogous to what we did with columns. I mean, the KL over R can go down and down and down, but it's not like the capacity goes to infinity. For example, when you plotted that, remember that homework assignment you did with the critical buckling stress? I had you plot slenderness on the x-axis and F-critical on the y. It's like even if slenderness went to zero, the F-critical had a limit. Like it couldn't go above the yield stress. Well, with beams, I don't care how far LB decreases, um, the capacity cannot be larger than MP. MP is the absolute maximum capacity. I'm going to stop for a sec though and I want to see if you all have any questions just conceptually about what I'm talking about. Particularly, I want to make sure that you understand that there is a difference between LB and L. They are not the same thing. I'm going to give everybody a sec on that. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. So let's let's move on and let's let's talk about a particular case of a beam and this is a continuously braced beam. So a continuously braced beam would be, you know, like here's your beam and it's like there's a brace everywhere, you know, like everywhere along the uh, the span. And so, you know, basically we're saying that LB is essentially 0, okay? In other words, that, that, that bracing uh, distance gets so small that LB approaches zero. Now, to be clear, there is a real-world example of this. It's not like this doesn't happen um, in the real world. It does. An example is a composite beam. Okay. Now, in a composite beam, what you're going to do is you're going to take that beam and you're going to weld what are called shear studs on the top of that beam. And so shear studs look like really big, really thick nails that get welded to the top of the beam. And so when you cast the concrete deck, the concrete deck, you know, first it's wet, you know, it's in that uh, wet state. You pour the deck, the, the concrete deck cures, and then it locks around those studs so that when you bend the beam, okay, when you bend the beam, you're not just bending the beam, you're bending the beam and the slab together. And that together behavior, that, that idea of the slab and the beam bending together, we have a name for that. We call that composite bending. So if you ever hear me use the term composite, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the steel and the concrete acting together. Okay. Now what we're going to do is consider a continuously braced beam uh, where you have that you know, quote unquote infinite number of braces. So another way of thinking about it is that for continuously braced beams, LB is zero. Now later, we're gonna look at what happens if LB is bigger than zero and we have discreetly braced uh, beams, but I just wanna make sure that you're clear on that. Now, if you have a, uh, you know, a, a, a steel beam, and, and this is true of continuously braced beams and discreetly braced beams, what's gonna be easier on the continuously braced beam side is this, the VMN. That's gonna be a lot easier, so just, just so you can uh, be clear. 
Now, ultimately, there's three different conditions that we need to assess for a beam. There's the moment capacity. So in other words, you have to have enough flexural capacity to withstand the bending moment on your, your moment diagram. We have to have enough shear capacity to withstand the, the highest shear in your shear diagram. Uh, and then we have deflection limits, okay? Now we need to meet all these, all these conditions regardless if you have a continuously braced beam or a discreetly braced beam. What makes the continuously braced beam easier is that VMN calc. Now there's a couple other notes um, uh, for later. Number one, I'm actually for now going to skip how to compute VVN. What we're going to do is we're going to use an analysis aid to just look it up. Um, but what we're going to find, uh, and, and the math will bear this out here in a bit, is that for most rolled shapes that are in buildings, shear kind of doesn't matter. Um, and what I mean by that is we're going to look at our load and we're going to have like 20 kips. And then we're going to look at our capacity and we're going to have like 110 kips. There's just going to be much more capacity than there is uh, load. The, um, the design of a steel beam in a building is largely dictated by the moment demand or the deflection demand. So it's, it's, it's not really going to be um, a, a, a big concern on the shear side of things. That's a little different than what we did in concrete design for those of you that had me for CE413. Shear became a thing. You know, we had to lay out stirrups. Remember, we had to draw the shear diagram and then we needed to pick out the stirrup spacings. That was a big thing in, um, in concrete design. And in here, it's going to be a little bit more, not much more than an afterthought. Um, the other thing that we're going to find is that the deflection calculations are a little bit more straightforward. And what I mean by that is in concrete design, we had to consider that some of the beam acted or some of the load acted on the beam before it was cracked. Some of the load acted on the beam after it was cracked or maybe a better way of putting that is that some of the beam is cracked and some of it isn't. And so we had to compute like an effective stiffness, that effective moment of inertia. We don't have to worry about that in steel design because the beam is steel and so it doesn't really crack under elastic behavior. Um, the one thing though that we will have to worry about, and this will become, I don't wanna say challenging on your homework assignment, but something you gotta pay attention to is the structural analysis. The actual analysis to get that deflection value, you might have to, you might have to think about that for a, for a little bit. Okay, now let's talk about VMM. Um, and hopefully you've got your manual with you because uh, I want you to turn to a couple things. First off, I don't want you to turn to chapter F if you don't want to, but you're more than welcome to. So hopefully by now you recognize that we've been going into the spec and we've been referring to different chapters for different phenomena. So chapter D was the chapter on tension members. Chapter E was the after, uh, chapter on compression members. Chapter F is the chapter on bending. So we'll actually refer to chapter F for beams. We'll also briefly refer to chapter G because chapter G is the chapter on shear. But again, shear, we're gonna talk about shear at the very, very end because you're gonna see how the numbers play out here in a bit. Um, the, for a continuously braced beam, the capacity is just Fy times Zx. That is the nominal bending capacity, which is the plastic moment. Now, uh, one other point I'll mention that does assume that the beam, uh, or that the element is not controlled by local buckling. I think I'm going to try and talk about local buckling at the very, very end so you can kind of understand what's going on there. Um, now, that is the way that you would compute the capacity. We can also look it up, and we can look it up using table 3-2. This is what table 3-2 looks like. I, I recommend everybody turn to this table right now. It starts on page 3-19, so I'm gonna give everybody a sec to find this. Uh, another thing that's worth mentioning, if you have a sticky note or a tab, I would tab this. This is a very heavily referenced table in the, the land of beam design. Um, I'm gonna give everybody a sec to find that. Now, one of the, the reasons that we use this table quite a bit is because it works for a lot more than just VMP, like your your uh, your plastic moment factored by your fee value. There's a lot of other stuff in this table. And right now, I'm sure that you're looking at this going, what is going on here? What is this LPLR stuff? You got a fee BF here. What is the deal? Don't worry. We will address all of that in very significant detail later. But the the Short answer, if, if you, you want sort of a, a peer into the future, is that this term 
this term, this term, and this term all relate to the uh, capacity of the beam if it's discreetly braced, because that's going to be um, uh, how we assess that buckling capacity. All of those terms relate to that. The only other things left in the table, and I'm going to change my highlighter so it's not the same color across the board, is we have this phi and P value, um, and we have the moment of inertia, and we have phi VM. Okay. Now, what we're going to do for the, the next little bit is we're actually just going to use this table to look up the shear capacity. We're not going to compute it. We're just going to look it up. Again, as you're going to see, it's not really going to matter, and we'll cover how to sh uh, compute shear capacity at the very end. So there's a lot of other values in this table, but when it's all said and done, we'll understand what they all mean. Now, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is this little blue box at the bottom. Um, the, the shapes, so the reason they call this the ZX table and why there's a big old ZX right here is because if you look at the, the table and look at these ZX values, you'll see what they did is, is they had a big old spreadsheet of, of the, all the rolled shapes and they just sorted them by the ZX value. So they're, they're sorted in that, uh, in that ZX uh, um, uh, uh, according to that ZX parameter. So if you're looking for a particular beam, like if you're looking for, a, I don't know, a W33 by 201, it might actually take you a little while to find it, so just be aware of that. But this table is meant primarily for a design guide, not an analysis guide, so that's why. There's another thing that you might notice is that some of the rows are bold. There is a reason why, and we will talk about that later. You could probably, with a little bit of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, attention to the table, you can probably guess why those values are bolded, but don't worry, I will tell you specifically why they are. There is a reason for that, and I will get to that uh, uh, probably next time. Now, um, let me let me take a step back. I want to see if anybody has any questions. Everybody with me so far? Okay, now some more details that are worth mentioning, and one of them is about deflections. Okay, so up until now, we've been using this. Okay, and we've been using stuff like this pretty heavily. Okay, now I want to go back to basics as to why we're doing this. Okay, so those load factors, those numbers, those 1.2 dead and 1.6 live, are intended to amplify the loads based on their uncer relative uncertainty. That's why we have a live load factor higher than the dead load factor. But they're meant to do that under the, the uh, condition of incipient failure. Like what we're trying to do is prevent the structure from falling down and killing people. Okay, So that's why we take the live load and up at 60%. And that's why we take the, the, the dead load and up at 20%. That's why we take the moment capacity and multiply it by a fee value of 0.9, you know, or if we were doing tension members, why yielding in the gross section had a fee value of 0.9 and fracture in the net section had a fee value of 0.75. Those are strength limit states. And we talked about this, you know, earlier in the semester, the idea that a strength limit state is intended to ensure the safety of the structure. And so we use factored loads and factored resistances. That's the whole point of LRFD. Okay, well now we need to talk about service limit states. Service limit states are intended to deal with day-to-day -day performance, just ensuring that the structure fulfills its intended use. It, it doesn't mean that the structure is going to fall down and kill somebody if you violate these limits. They're just limits that you need to assess. I'm going to give you a real-world example of this uh, here in a bit. So one of the deflection limits that we use very commonly for um, for beams in buildings is the deflection limit of L over 360. So just so you're aware, deflection limits are very commonly a function of the beam's length. So the longer the beam is, the more deflection that you will allow. So to put this in perspective, if I have a beam, you know, as an example, if the beam is 30 foot long, then delta max is like one inch. So, I mean, think about that. You know, you have a beam that's 30 foot long and we're only letting it deflect like that amount, 
Okay, now why? Why is that limit uh, 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 present, you know? Well, it doesn't mean if I violate that limit that the beam's going to fall down and explode and kill people. That's not the point of the limit, okay? How many of you have ever been in a building that had plastered roofs or plastered ceilings? So, Mr. Geis, oh, do you have a question or were you just agreeing with me? I was just agreeing with you. Well, the, okay, there you go, okay. So the reason, uh, I see an example in the chat for, uh, for, for Barrett. So here's the reason for that L over 360 limit. If you start violating that L over 360 limit, the idea is that you'll start to crack the plaster that's on the roof, okay? That doesn't mean that the structure is going to fall down and kill somebody, but it does mean that the structure is not performing its intended use, okay? So how do we handle that? When we assess deflections, i.e. service limit states, we use service loads, okay? So whenever we are assessing deflections, we do not use load factors, okay? So we use 1.2 dead and 1.6 live for the moment and for the shear, for the strength limit state moment, the strength limit state shear. But for service limit states, we do not use load factors. We just take the dead plus the live, or in many cases, we just look at the live. Most deflection limits are live load deflection limits because we can um, we can usually get around dead load deflection limits with things like camber and whatnot. You know, for instance, we can bend the beam upwards, you know, uh, uh, like a half an inch or three quarters of an inch so that when the dead load sits on it, it sits flat. We can get around dead load uh, deflection limits. Live loads, live loads are a function of the structure's occupancy and so that's where uh, a lot of the deflection limits come, uh, uh, come into play. So no load factors when doing deflections, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. And again, steel beams don't crack like, like reinforced concrete beams. So for those of you that had me for reinforced concrete design, we're not gonna have to do that effective moment of inertia stuff. Okay, now I do wanna reference something that we did at the very end of structural analysis last fall. We did this during uh, dead week. We looked at generating analysis aids. You might remember I gave you all a homework assignment where I said, you know, here's a beam with, let's say some triangular load or something I really don't remember, but the idea is that you would derive formulas that would do the structural analysis for you. And one of the things I told you, as I said, well, in design land, we use these formulas quite a bit so that we don't have to draw the shear and moment diagrams. Well, guess what? This is structural steel design, so we're gonna start using some of those formulas. And the nice thing about the manual is those formulas are in here for you, okay? So I want everybody to turn to 3-208, okay? This is, so again, if you go to that, um, the, those silver tabs where, you know, one says beam and one says column, this is right before the column section. So it's table 3-23. I want to give everybody a sec to, uh, uh, to turn to this. I would tab this too. Yes, I would tab this too. This is a structural analysis aid. So actually this, this table would probably help you if you were doing steel design or reinforced concrete design. It doesn't really matter because this is just structural analysis, right? This, this aid doesn't really care if the beams are made of steel or concrete or popsicle sticks. It doesn't really care. If I have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, what do I know? I know the reaction is WL over two. I have a, an equation for the shear as a function of x, and I have an equation for the moment as a function of x. So if I wanted to go in Excel and plot my shear diagram and plot my moment diagram, I've got those equations derived for me, right? What about the maximum moment at, at the center, right? Here's, the, um, here's the, the, the shear diagram. So the shear diagram goes up, linear shear diagram goes down, right? compute the area of a shear diagram, lot to a little, little to a lot, and so that's the maximum bending moment, and that's WL squared over eight. We did this last semester in structural analysis, so we can derive those if needed. Another thing that these uh, design aids do, and they go uh, a little bit step further, is they look at deflections. Five WL to the fourth over 384 EI, the maximum deflection at mid-span for a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. 
And if you go to this table, there's oodles and oodles of cases. I think there's something like 30 cases, 32, 39, 45, 45 cases for, um, for various situations, looking at moving loads, looking at continuous loads, simple beams, uh, or sorry, sorry, continuous beams, simple beams, cantilevered beams, you name it. And so it is your responsibility as the analyst to apply the right situation to the right beam in question. We're gonna use some of these today for the following example. So let's talk a little bit about this example and we're gonna uh, uh, do this example start finish. So um, I have a beam, it is continuously braced. It is a W21 by 62. Um, it's A992 steel, which I said, you know, FY is 50 KSI. We're gonna be doing 50 KSI steel pretty much across the board for the rest of the semester. It is subjected to a dead load of one kip per foot it is subjected to a live load of one and a half kips per foot. The dead load shown does not include the beam self weight, so we're gonna have to add that. Um, the, uh, uh, we're gonna verify that the beam has adequate moment capacity, we're gonna verify that the beam has adequate shear capacity, and we're gonna verify that the beam meets a live load deflection limit of L over 400. So let me walk you through how that works. So let's um, stop that share, let's share my notebook here. All right, so here's the beam. I'm gonna give everybody a sec to copy some of this down and we're gonna to get to work. I'm gonna make this a little smaller if that's okay. Okay. All right. Oh, let me pull my chat up here so that I can see you all helping me out with this question. All right, um, while we're at it, somebody help me out. So we have a W21 by 62, all right. Um, can somebody help me out? What is the ZX for a W21 by 62? Does anybody know that? Or can you find it? either in table 3-2 or in table 1-1. Yeah, I have that right here. What's that? No, uh, this, this you can just look up. This is on page 1-21. And the ZX for a W21 by 62 is 144 cubic inches. And so I uh, found that, as, as Mr. Roman said, uh, you can find this in table 1-1, page 1-21. So if you pull up my, uh, if you look at the webcam here, you can see, I mean, I'm just in the W sh uh, shapes and it's uh, right here, you know, on this on this second sheet. As Mr. Roman said, you can also find it in the ZX table and it's on page 3-25. Probably a good idea to go ahead and turn to that now uh, on page 3-25. It's one of the bolded rows. It's actually the second row down on the right page that's bolded um, on page 3-25. Okay, now um, let's, let's look at a, a couple things. The first thing we're gonna do is look at the structural analysis. Now, I'm going to do this structural analysis maybe a little inefficiently, but the reason I'm doing it this way is because you kind of have to do it this way on your homework assignment. Um, and that'll, that'll become clear here in a bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at each load case separately. Okay, so we're gonna look at the dead loads. This is a 32 foot long beam. And then we're gonna look at the live loads. And I'm gonna just sort of copy this over because I am not 
maybe a little lazy. Okay. Now, for the live loads, let's do the live loads first actually over here. We were given a live load of 1.5 kip per foot, okay? So we need to determine the shear due to that live load and we need to determine the moment due to that live load, okay? Now what we can do is we can go to our handy dandy analysis aid on page 3-208 and it already does this for us. And for a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load, this is WL squared over 8. So 1.5 kips per foot times 32 feet squared all divided by 8. And for the shear, the shear is going to be just the reactions, just WL over 2. So WL over 2. No square on that. So somebody help me out. What are we getting for dead load and for live, or sorry, for, for shear and moment for live load? So live load 192 foot kips. Do I have a second on that? While you all are computing that, I just want to make sure that you see where I'm getting that. Bear with me. Bear with me, sorry. I want you to see where I'm getting that. I'm getting just that from right here, okay? So that you see where those formulas are coming from. I don't want you to see that I'm just making stuff up. You know, M max is WL squared over 8. And then the shear, you know, if you look at the shear diagram right here, the maximum shear is, is the reaction. And so that's just WL over 2. I just want to make sure that you all see that, that I'm just not putting stuff on the, on the page that you don't know where that comes from. Okay, so what did you get for our shear? You got 24, and that's 24 kips. Now, Mr. Romans is the only one saying anything. Is anybody seconding me on this? Okay, all right. There we go. You say you second. <laughs> all right, so let me delete this to get out of get it out of the way because I got room. Okay. Now, that's the live loads, okay? So maybe I'll put a, a little star, you know, right there just to make sure I have that. Okay, now what about the dead loads? Now, the reason I'm doing the dead loads separate is because there's more than one dead load on the beam. So there's the dead load of one kit per foot, and there is a, a name for that. There's a word I'm going to use called superimposed. In other words, there was already a dead load present on the beam, and this is 1,000 pounds per foot added on top of that. What load was already present on the beam? W naught, and W naught is the self weight. Now, what is the self weight of a, well, now hold on, now hold on. What is the self, like, like how did you get that 1984 pounds? Okay, all right. So what you did is you already distributed the weight. What I'm saying is that the self weight, don't don't do it like that. I'm saying point zero six two kips per foot. Why is it point zero six two kips per foot? Because if I scroll up here, the self weight is sixty two pounds per foot or 0 0.062 kips per foot. So what I'm saying is that when I, here, let's, let's do it in order. When I do shear dead, for example, I'm gonna say 
w naught plus wd l over 2. And when I say moment dead, I'm going to say w naught plus wd l squared over 8. And so this is going to be like 1.062 kips per foot, 32 foot over 2, and this is going to be 1.062 kips per foot times 32 foot squared over 8. Okay? With me so far? So you're right, that's how much the beam weighs, but as an analyst, I need like the weight per foot so that I can compute shears and moments. Now somebody give me a, a shear for the dead load and a shear for the live load, so. VD is 16.992, so, and, okay, that was seconded. What about an MD is 135.94. Okay, so now we've got a dead load and a live load, so now I can start factoring, and I can say, okay, VU is 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live, and MU is 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. So factor them, uh, uh, factor each component. Now, one of the reasons I said this was inefficient is, well, couldn't I just factor the WD, the W naught, the WL, and then do my structural analysis? I could have done that. The problem is, is that um, that's that really only works if everything's a distributed load and everything's simply supported. As soon as I throw a point load in there or some triangular loads, it doesn't really work. You kind of need to just do the moments separately for the dead loads and the moments separately for the live loads and then factor it all together. And you're going to have to do that on your homework assignment. All right, so does anybody have a VU and an MU? VU is 58.8. I have a second on that. And an MU. 470.3. Do I have a second on that? Cool. All right. So now we have our factored loads. Okay. So... In terms of strength limit states and whatnot, we're good there. The, or, or we're good on the analysis. Now we have to look at the capacity. Now for a continuously braced beam, so capacity. Now first off, we're going to compute phi MN just to make sure that we're comfortable with it. So phi MN is just phi MP, which is 0 0.9, because that's phi, and then MP is just FY ZX. And so all we got to do is take 0 0.9 times 50 KSI, and then our, uh, our we need our, our ZX, which we got here in the chat, uh, thanks to Mr. Romans, that was 144 cubic inches. Now, when I compute all this out, that's going to be in inch kips. So what I need to do is I need to convert just 1 over 12. And so what do we get for phi MN? 540. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, I want to show you something. Bear with me because I'm going to pull this in the manual. 
From the table. Yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna I'm actually gonna screen cap that into the into the sheet here because I want to show you something. Bear with me. While we're while you're waiting on me, turn to page three dash twenty five because I want to do this with you. Okay, so if you go to 3-25, it should look like this. Is everybody able to find that? Okay, hold on, my chat went away. Good. Now, so right off the bat, as, as uh, Mr. Romans pointed out, like you can see, we're getting the same 540 as the table guy, because we're on the W21 by 62. But the nice thing that the table gives us is it also gives us phi VN, and for convenience sake, it also gives us the moment of inertia. We're gonna use that here in a second. But um, let me just sort of summarize that to make sure that we're clear. So phi MN is 540 foot kips. And then according to you all, you all told me that MU was 470.3 so all right so yeah I you 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 stole the the words I had mentioned that earlier like why are some of the rows bolded there is a reason why some of them are bolded they are more commonly used but that but there's a reason why for that as well I'll go ahead and tell you but this is going to become more clear on Wednesday when we start looking at design if you look at a given group, like for example, look at this group, the top one is the lightest. The bold row is the lightest of that group. So that's why. Now, what we're also gonna do, I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that we get to this deflection calc. I don't wanna lo lose track on time. Um, I wanna also, use the capacity here from the table. So according to the table, the capacity in shear is 252 kips. And we got a shear of 58.8. I mean, again, just a phenomenal amount of shear capacity compared to the load. So can you look at that box, and so far, we haven't looked at deflection, but so far, can you tell me what's going on with this beam? Is this beam good, or is it no good? It's good, yeah. We have more capacity than we do load, so we're good. That's exactly right. So the only thing left to assess is deflections, and I wanna see if we can take care of this really quickly. So deflections. So if you remember, we have a WL of uh, 1.5 kips per foot. The beam length is 32 feet long. E is 29,000 KSI. You better have that number burned into the back of your head. And the moment of inertia, we just looked that up right up here. It's 1330 inches to the fourth. Now, if I go off of my analysis aid, hold on. If I go off of my analysis aid right here, oh, losing my mouse pointer. My analysis aid tells me that the maximum uh, uh, deflection is 5WL to the fourth over 384EI. So I needed those four values, okay? So if I want to determine my, uh, my maximum live load deflection, it's just 5WL to the fourth over 384EI. In this case, IX. Maybe I'll put the subscript there just so you know that that's the strong axis. Now, 5, 1.5 kips per foot, 32 feet to the fourth, 384, 29,000, 
If you were paying attention, I mentioned that there's a conversion factor we need to throw in there. And even if you weren't paying attention, you should remember that from structural analysis. Anybody remember that, that conversion factor? Seventeen twenty-eight. That's exactly right. That's because we're converting cubic inches to cubic feet, uh, or sorry, cubic feet to cubic inches. And so, when you chug all this out, what do you get? I know we're getting short on time, so while you all are chugging that out, okay, zero point ninety-two inches. Do I have a second on that? There we go. Okay, now what we need to do is ensure that we don't get uh, deflect more than the limit. For this beam, the deflection limit was L over 400. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So L over 400. So L over 400, which is 32 feet over 400. But again, to compare apples to apples, got to convert that. So 32 times 12 over 400 is 0 0.96 inches. So uh, do I have a second on that? There we go. And so what does that mean? Are we good or not? Good, exactly. So if we wanted to summarize what's going on with this problem, the beam is adequate. But um, the, the bigger lesson here is that if you look just at one limit state, like for example, if all we looked at was shear, right? If we look at shear, we find that, you know, we have 58.8 kips of load and 252 kips of capacity. It looks like the beam is way over designed. Um, and if all we cared about was shear, well then yeah, I guess it is. Um, even with moment, the moment has it has a 470 foot kips of load and 540 kips of resistance. Looks like it's way over designed because there are other limits. And when you look at the deflection, you find that it is deflecting 0.92 inches and it can only deflect 0.96. That's pretty good, okay? And so that's what we call, that's what controlled the design. In this problem, it would have been the deflection, okay? Now, um, I know we're running short on time, so here's all I'll say about the homework assignment. In your homework assignment, it's very similar to this. The only difference is that the structural analysis is not a simply supported beam, it's a cantilevered beam. And I will go ahead and tell you, the one thing that you're gonna have to pay attention to is the deflection, particularly the deflection due to the live loads. If you try and take the live loads and convert them into a distributed load, that is wrong. Don't do that, okay? Instead, you've gotta handle the point loads as they are. And I even point you to the cases in the manual to go off of, you just got to go through and do the algebra. It's going to be an algebra exercise. Any other super quick questions before we call it? All right, hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording uh, and I'll get this posted soon. Uh, the homework should be available in the next seven minutes. So it turns on at noon. All right. That's all I got, everybody. Let me stop the recording, and I will see you all on Wednesday.